Head over to MiniatureMarket.com where they have thousands of board games at discounted prices and you can sign up for product alerts. Hello my friends, it's the Game Boy Geek here. Later this week, the Spiel Essen convention is gonna happen in Germany. And so I thought I would come up with a list of games that I've already played that I really like that are gonna be available or releasing there. And so I'm gonna give you just a little bit of uh, you know, explanation of how the games work and why I, I think that they are in this top 10 games that's released in there that I've already had a chance and have been privileged enough to play. Here we go. Number 10. Number 10. Number 10. Number 10. This first one is from a designer and a publisher that both have a proven track record. This is Neoville, designed by Phil Walker Harding, one of my favorite designers, and Blue Orange Games, who always does great stuff. Now in this game, you're building a city. And this city is built up of different tiles. You're building a four by four grid of tiles, and each of those tiles have four little terrains on there. And you're making up these districts of different types, like water and you know greenery and you know the brown terrain and rocks. And as you're doing this, you're also possibly building skyscrapers there. And when you build these skyscrapers, they're going to have to be a certain uh, you know uh, on terrain that's certain style big. So for example, if you grab a 12-point skyscraper, it has to go in a, in a district that has at least 12 squares of that type by the end of the game. If so, you'll get 12 points. If not, you'll get minus 12. So there's a lot of this like, hmm, I'm trying to plan for this. Should I grab this before other players do? Because only there's only one of everything. Plus, there's these other things that you can get. Uh, there's windmills uh, or there's these little monorail things that go up and down. Uh, and there's biodomes. And you only play with two of those three. And even with that, you're only playing with five of them randomly. And these do different things like, hey, uh, like like the, the, the monorail ones. They'll be like, hey, I want to have uh, four parks. Uh, up and down or left and right from where this is. Uh, or, you know, I need, I need this terrain to be in exactly this sort of polynomial shape and things like that. So it's interesting because you have all these different goals that you're going for. All the goals are different every game and you're literally building your grid the way you want. So it's a pretty quick sort of light, I'd say it's lighter than his Baron Park, but there's definitely some tension of speed of when you get things when you're trying to get for the you know the goals what you're going to try to build with uh, and you're simply just playing a tile and drawing a tile and you have a hand of three and that's it but it's a simple great little you know city building game with some strategy and some sort of press your luck as to how long you want to wait before you grab a certain you know thing to put on your city uh it's a good solid game neoville number nine this next one is a two-player tactical card driven game called Lawyer Up. Now this game has, I think the base game comes with two cases and the cases are infinitely re replayable because it's a card game. Uh, it's really cool because uh, depending on the case, you have different goals. Like in one of the cases, the, the murder one, uh, all the prosecution basically has to lock up all the juries or at least have all the jurors on their side unanimously. Where on the, the, the first case in the game with the art, uh, you don't have to have that. You just have to have more than the other. So there's different goals depending on the different cases. But in this game, it's really interesting because at the beginning you go through discovery where you're like looking at some cards and you're deciding keep one, give one to my opponent and like hide one or bury evidence. Now there's certain cards that will help you bury, like get buried evidence later. Uh, but it's a cool way of like looking at your hand at the beginning and like deciding what you want to keep, what's going to help them. And then it's a matter of like players are calling witnesses up and that witness might be good for the defense or good for the prosecution. And you're going to be playing cards in succession, trying to match icons of different types as you play them. But a lot of these cards have special abilities as well, but the only the ability that's, that's seen is active. So you might be covering up an ability that you want. So there's a lot of different things to think about as to about which cards I want to play this round with this witness, and in which order do I need to play these in, either both to line up the icons correctly to get the most cards out, or maybe to, to make an, an act a very strong, powerful ability if that's my last card, for example. And it's a little bit of back and forth you're doing this and doing that and you're going through a bunch of different witnesses it's a really clever two-player tactical game if you like that style of game like 1960 making a president and uh you know twilight struggle there's no board here or anything but if you like that style of game where you got to think of order of your cards and things like that check out lawyer up number eight this next one is an abstract strategy game uh, from Board and Dice. Let me give you a woman overview of how this works. 
Mandala Stones is a game of tranquility and beauty where you'll be collecting stones from a main board available to all players and placing them on your own personal board. As the game goes on, your own board will build up with more and more stacks of stones. You're trying to find the right time to score a specific color that you can see on top of all of your personal stacks. But all of these stacks score differently. Some of them score for the height of the stack. For example, if we were scoring purple this turn, this stack would score 4 points because it's 3 tall, and this one over here would score 1 point plus 1 for each of the colors there for a total of 4 points. So those two purple totaled me 8 points. When done scoring those stones on the scoreboard, they might earn you bonus points. Or you might be setting someone else up for bonuses, so the timing of your scoring is an important part of your strategy. You're trying to be as efficient as possible and score as much as you can in one single turn. But as you see here, we're now set up to score blue on all five of our stacks next turn. That took a lot of forward planning, but the payoff will be huge. Collecting the stones to place on your board also requires forethought and planning. First, you'll move one of these artist tokens to an open spot. Then, you'll take up to four stones that are adjacent to that artist, but only ones that match the pattern of the artist you selected, and which are also not adjacent to any other artist. And from the ones you'll take, you get to decide which one you take first, then in a clockwise manner, which, as we've already seen, the order of those stones in the stack are very important to scoring. On top of all this, you'll also have two hidden objectives that you can work for but you'll only be able to score for one of them at the end of the game, like six points, if you end the game with exactly three stones on your board. Or seven points if you end the game with only this pattern visible on your board. Now, ever since Azul, everyone, there's a lot of games coming out that are trying to sort of be in that space, which is have some really beautiful, chunky components, have it look great on the table, but have it be abstract, have it be very interesting. I really like this game. I like that at the beginning it's a little easy to set up, but then as the game goes on it gets harder and harder and you have to be more and more efficient as to what you're doing, what you're setting up, the order of what you take things matter, the, you're trying to be as efficient as you can and score as many as you can of that one color on top, but you, if you set yourself up right, maybe when you take those off, you have a, a lot of the same color after that. And so you can like have a bunch of turns where you're scoring in a row. Then even when you're scoring, it's like, do I want to score now? Or do I, I might be setting them up for a bonus. Uh, there's just lots of little nuances in this game and the abstract as aspect of it is great. And the replayability is off the charts because every time the board is going to be completely different the way that those stones come out. So I really like this one. If you like abstract strategy games like Azul, you'll definitely want to check this one out, Mandala Stones. Number seven. This next one is a two-player card game that actually came out many years ago, but it's being re-released. This is called Matcha. Again, two-player card game. Let me give you a one-minute overview of how this works. Matcha is a two-player card game where you're having a tea ceremony. You're trying to win tokens like the Red Bull for this card. Because over the course of the game, if you're able to get three tokens of Matcha, Bulls, Water, or Scoops, you'll win. Each set is made up of three different rounds, and you'll play them each separately. Players will be playing cards face down in front of themselves and then revealing them. This one has to do with the red bulls, and whoever has the best red bull is going to win. Two versus one, and they all match, so this player would get one of the three bulls needed to win the game. Now on this side, we're looking at the numbers. You want to have the number one to match. We have one here, we have one here. We look at what suit is the best. Typically, it's matcha. However, the yellow spoon beats matcha, so this one would beat what normally the best suit, and this one would get the water because that's what they were fighting over. Again, whoever gets any three of those tokens first of the same type wins. But if one player matches like the one, but the other one doesn't, the one that didn't gets a whisk, and if you get four whisks, you win, so you can purposely mess up to win. That's a strategy. You'll then go on to play the second and third round of the set, and if no one's won, you'll play another additional set of three rounds. Whoever gets three of the main same tokens first wins, or four of the wists. And since there's only 18 total cards, including two zeros in the deck, you never have perfect information, but you have a lot of it, so you can use deduction to win this game. Now this game came out during sort of the micro game craze after Love Letter. Uh, and so many games were forgotten about that have come out with like 16 cards or something like that. This is one of the ones for me that has still stuck around and I still enjoy playing because it's got such a, an interesting aspect of like a little bit of chicken and a little bit of like deduction of trying to figure out, okay, well, I see these cards are on there. They, I don't have that card. It might be this one or is it one of the ones that's been removed this round? And you're trying to either match or not match depending on what you want. Sometimes you don't want to match. 
uh, and you, you know you want to get the whisk, for example. So there's a lot of little clever things, a lot of clever tactical things to play in this game, along with a little bit of deduction. It's quick, it's easy. Uh, go watch my review for this. They did change some of the rules in this uh, in this version, and I actually preferred some of the. The, the, the original rules for this game a little better, but there's nothing that you couldn't play this new version with with the old rules if you found that version to be better as I did. Uh, so go back and watch that review, match a two player card game. Number six. This next one matches together trick taking with hidden identity social deduction style game. This is Shamans. Let me give you a one minute overview of how this works. Shamans is a trick-taking game mixed with hidden identity. You might be good or bad, but you're gonna be playing cards, trying to get eight points after multiple rounds to be the winner. You'll be playing tricks as normal, but you don't have to follow suit. And if you don't, it's gonna move this token towards the moon. If it ever gets there, all the bad players win the round immediately and get three points. The lowest card thrown by the lead suit, that player gets one of these tokens with special abilities or even a hidden one, like moving this one way or another whenever they want, or even revealing their role to everyone to show them who they really are. But when the last card of a suit's played, you get to activate that suit's ability, which is sometimes done by following suit, but other times can be played off suit to finish it off. If you're a bad guy, that's a great move. And you can use that ability to use one of your stab tokens to eliminate a player revealing their role. But you gotta be careful because every card that player still holds if they were good moves this one spot. And again, if it gets to the moon, the bad guys won the round. But if you've killed the last shadow player, then all the good players will win and get two points. Be the first to get eight points and you win the game. Yeah, this one is so fresh. I love it when, when games come out and they just use mechanisms and they put things together that normally don't go together. Uh, this works really well. It's really fun because each round the roles get swapped, right? And so you might be the bad person of the shadow one round, and then you just sit for one hand, and then you'll be something else the next hand. And I like how you're you're, you're trying to figure out what to do, what, uh, you're trying to figure out when to try to time the right time to play the right suit off suit to try to you know get the special ability. I like that sometimes you might even end up trying to kill someone that's even on your team because you don't want them to win. Uh, there's some really interesting dynamics here all wrapped around sort of the trick-taking element. So if you like both of those things, this is a great one to try out. It works okay with three, but it's definitely better with four or five players. That's Shamans. Number five. This next one is a new standalone game in the King Domino universe. I just recently reviewed this called King Domino Origins. This essentially takes the original King Domino adds a tiny little tweak to make it a little bit more interesting, but not harder to play. But then there's two other versions to play, uh, which is more sort of gamer centric, where there's more things going on, whether you're, you're gathering resources when you get specific cards. And like Longest Road in Catan, you're trying to get, uh, you have the most of certain resources at the end of the game. Uh, plus all the resources are worth a point. Or you can play the third version where you're spending those resources that you get, uh, and, and you're getting these caveman tiles that go on and those things are gonna score in all different ways, like having a certain amount of mushroom resources around me, or having other cavemen around me, or just scoring straight points. And another just level of you know spatial puzzle in this one. So if this sounds interesting, again, go back and look at my review. I just did this about a week or two ago, King Domino Origins. Number four. four, four, four. This next one is called 10. Uh, and it came out from AEG here in the North America and it's just being released at Essen. This is a fun, 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 press your luck style game. We're gonna be flipping cards and it looks like a classic game but it has more of a modern look to it. You're simply just trying to get all nine cards, one through nine, in different colors. There's four different suits, I believe. And you're gonna get a point for every number in your longest run of any color at the end of the game. But if you get all nine of them, you actually get 10 points, which is why the game's called 10. But there's also some wild numbers, and when they come up, you're going to auction. Everyone has some currency. And as you're pressing your luck, you might bust, which helps other players out, uh, and it kind of screws you up. You get a little bit of consolation too. But when, uh, as you're trying to you know, get more and more cards, different other cards come out with currency, and that actually makes it a little easier to not bust, but at some point you could still bust with those too. So it's like this really interesting sort of seesaw teeter-totter that I haven't seen in a Press Your Luck game before that I really like. And the aspect of having this currency and when really good cards come up, everything stops and people auction. It's just a really great sort of quick filler, 30 minute Press Your Luck and set collection style game. It's really fun, 10. Number three. 
Number three is a game that's co-designed by Reiner Knizia. Uh, in here, uh, it was originally released, I think, by r, &R Games, but, and I forget who's publishing it in uh, at Essen. Uh, this one is, uh, again, co-designed by Reiner Knizia, and this is a game that feels like a Steffen Feld game. If you like those style of games where there's a bunch of different actions you can take and each of those have a different ability and each of those score differently and do different things here and there, it's really interesting because you have your own cauldron. And if you've ever played Ingenious or Axio or something like that from Rhino Canizia, it uses that style mechanism where you have these tiles and you're placing them in your own cauldron. And every time you place a tile, you could take the actions that are on those that tile. There's basically two of them. But if you're able to link together in a network the same icon close to it, you might play an action and get five, a power of five of a certain action. And then maybe a power of two of some other action. And you're building up sort of this engine on your own board, kind of like how it is in Ingenious. But then all of those actions do all sorts of different things. Some of them are building routes on a board, like Ticket to Ride, if you will. And when you, can, when you finish routes, you're getting points. That's gonna allow you to bring your witches on with a different action and move them around and get different things. You're gonna get objective cards, which will give you points for all different things in the game, lots of different strategies, like having your witches in certain spots on the board. Different ways to get scrolls for objectives, different way to go down a track to get other abilities, or you can go around a pentagram and get some, some special extra actions and or points right off the bat. Lots going on here, but this is an excellent game. And even with two players, you could play this in like 40 minutes. With four players, you could play it in just around 60 minutes or a little bit more. For as short of a game this is, it packs a lot and a ton of punch, Witchstone. Number two. Number two is Cascadia. Now, this one, if you've ever played um, Calico, it's very similar in the fact that it's a very puzzly game. You have these little hexes that you're putting together in sort of a route building puzzly nature and you're trying to score points. Now in this case, there's different animals and there's different terrains. And each turn you're going to grab a, a matched set of a tile that has a terrain and an animal. And there's certain terrain tiles that will allow certain animals on there and you're placing those on there and each of these animals score differently in each game the same animal will score differently. For example, for the bear, there's multiple ways that the bear can score. You're shuffling a bunch of these cards and you're randomly picking it once per game. So not only does every animal score differently, every animal itself have different ways to score each time you play the game, which is awesome. And so you're placing these animals on terrains and they're scoring in different ways. Like the salmon, you're trying to make maybe a long route that connects them all. Or maybe the bears, you want to have them in groups of two or three. Or maybe the, the elk, you want them in a line and things like that. So, so that sometimes you want the hawks like not touching any other hawk. All these different ways, and so it's a very spatial puzzle, but you're also trying to build up the terrains because at the end of the game, whoever has the largest terrain of each is gonna be getting more points. And so it's this really interesting two competing goals of like trying to score for the animals, but also trying to keep the, the terrains together. Super, super interesting. This game is fantastic, Cascadia. Number one. All right, number one is a game uh, called Sobek Two Player, and it's designed by Bruno Cathala, my favorite designer, and Sebastian Pochan, who did Jaipur. Uh, and it mixes a little bit of King Domino and Jaipur together. Let me give you a woman overview of how this works. Sobek Two Players is a set collection game where you're gonna be collecting different types of goods, but also using special characters for special abilities. And at the end, you're gonna be adding up all your different sets, the number of tiles times the number of scarabs, and you're gonna be adding numbers of coins that you get from this bag throughout the game. You're gonna be collecting tiles by moving the Ankh in the direction, but then setting it in the direction that that tile talks about. You can play a character for your turn and do all sorts of cool things, like grabbing any tile on the entire board or getting a bunch from the stack. Or on your turn, maybe you're selling a set and you need at least three of them to sell. And if you're a little short, you can use a character that has that type of good as part of that set. But the timing of that selling is important because you get to secretly look at some of these abilities and activate one. And these do all sorts of cool things like taking another turn immediately or adding scarabs to your sets or many more. And you don't even have to take the first tile there. You can take another one that you really want, but you must add all the ones you skipped to your corruption. And corruption's bad because whoever has the most at the end of the game, the other player gets a coin, and they might get more coins if you have a lot more than them. Whoever has the most points from all their different sets plus coins is the winner. Yeah, this game is amazing. It packs so much into a 30-minute game that you feel like you've played a 60-minute game in a good way. It's so tactical. It's got that abstract aspect where you're trying to 
figure out what do you need, but thinking two or three turns ahead and thinking if I go here, then they're gonna be able to go here, which will put me here, which will put them there. I don't know if I wanna do that. So there's lots of thinking that way. Then you've got the characters and the whole timing of selling things. And when you sell things, you can, you can look at some of the, the, the tokens for special abilities and use those. Or sometimes you can just play a character for a special ability. Or sometimes you play a character along with another set to make sure you score those. Or maybe instead of getting something, you do one of those other things, like use a character, even if you don't really want to, just to throw off the cadence of what the other player thought you were gonna be forced to do. Oh my gosh, this game has so many layers of depth, and it's just, every game feels different because it's all randomized as to where the tiles are, the tokens, the abilities, the characters. This game, if you like sort of abstract style two-player games that also have set collection and timing and pressure, luck, and special abilities, this has so much going on and it's so streamlined. It takes the best of the set collection of Jaipur, it even does that even better, and it has the, the scoring of sort of the King Domino multiplier. Oh man, this game's awesome. Go check this one out, Sobek 2 player. Well, I hope this helped you uh, check out some games that you might not know was being released there, but these are tried and true ones that I love. So check these ones out. This has been the Game Boy Geek, breaking down barriers, growing relationships through board games, by helping you on the next one you'll love. Game Toppers not only transforms your existing table to a high quality gaming solution, they now offer full leg kits and dining cover solutions for the full table application. Paired with their amazing thematic premium stitch edge mats from noted board game artists like Vincent Dutre, collapsible cup holders, and really cool accessories, it's a complete system that upgrades every game you play. Go to GameToppersLLC.com or click the link below.